welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, okay. which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking with Juliana Buring, who is an ultra-endurance cyclist, best-selling author, and children's rights activist. She holds the first Guinness World Record for the fastest woman to circumnavigate the world by bicycle. Juliana was the only woman to race in the inaugural 2013 transcontinental race from London to Istanbul, coming in ninth place overall. And in 2014, Juliana participated in the inaugural Trans Am bike race across America, winning the women's category and coming in fourth place overall. Hi, Juliana. How are you? Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm great. So where are you, where are you based at the moment? Where are you living? I'm on the beautiful Amalfi Coast, just south of Naples in Italy. Very nice place for riding bikes. <laughs> Gosh, that sounds absolutely amazing. How long have you been living there for? Well, I moved to Naples in 2009, so I've been here now around this area over seven years. That sounds absolutely stunning. So, Juliana, you have done some incredible feats in cycling, and it sounds absolutely incredible. I can't wait to get into these in more detail. But what I always think is really fascinating is almost going back to the start, going back to when you were a child growing up. Were you from a sporty family? Mm -hmm. were, were, you, were you active? Were you into cycling from a young age? No, I grew up in a very strange environment. I grew up in a cult, <laughs> so... We didn't do much sport. We did do a lot of kind of military drills, so a lot of aerobic kind of exercises, push-up, jogging, uh, that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but as a, as an athlete or as a sportive kind of person growing up, no, not, I was not. And I only took up cycling uh, when I decided to cycle around the world. So I was 30, and I pretty much had to learn how to ride a bike. <laughs> to, to be honest, I was like, I'm always like a little bit wow. So like. Growing up in a in a in a cult like that sounds I don't even know what that sounds like. That's that must have been incredibly <laughs> challenging from such a young such a, a young age. I mean, how did you did you break out of the cult or, or, or what happened? Yes, I was a young adult when I decided to make my exit, and that was largely well, it was a number of factors, but I stayed in for as long as I did because I was helping raise my younger brothers and sisters, and I didn't want to leave them behind and I finally realized I could do more good for them on the outside than the inside so I ended up leaving right around the time when my one of my sisters committed suicide and and that was also big impetuous for me to start working to try and change things for my brothers and sisters who were still in so together with two of my other sisters who were already out of the group we wrote a book uh, which became a bestseller exposing the human human rights abuses primarily against the children who grew up in the group. And with that book and a number of documentaries and publicity in the media, the group eventually was forced to disband in 2010. Yeah, my brothers and sisters are now living normal lives, going to school, happy, um, thriving, and I could not be happier for the outcome of that. Oh, God, absolutely. Now, I, I think your, your first book was called Not Without My Sister. It's, yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I mean, I'm so sorry to hear about about your sister and committing committing suicide and I think obviously you it must have had a huge impact on your life going forward and that's why you're an advocate for for children's rights and I mean what you've done in that area is absolutely amazing so it, it must have been yeah. a, such a transition or or was that linked into into why you wanted to take up cycling or, or how did you end up on that journey well I think actually by the time I had decided to go into cycling I had well moved on in life and um, accomplished well a number of different things and I think my childhood had you know I'd kind of put those demons to rest and I got into cycling actually for <laughs> another kind of a tragedy where I had a, a a man who I really loved who I had met in Africa when I was living there in 2002 I met him the first time and we had an on and off again kind of relationship and ended up meeting each other again, well, finding each other again on Facebook and kind of reconnecting. And uh, we had a very intense, I wouldn't say affair, it was, it was more of a deep, it was more of a friendship. You know, it was a, a correspondence that we really spoke almost every day. We, we had a lot of the same life philosophies that we shared and 
you know, he was the kind of person I would go to to discuss different ideas, different philosophies, different passions, different, oh, everything, you know, and it was it was rare for me to find such a person. So we decided we were going to meet up finally in the end and, and see if we could give it a go. And we were both very adventurous, independent people, so we were not sure what was going to happen, but we then let's just try. So we arranged to meet for New Year 2011. And he had gone on an expedition. He was an explorer in Africa. And he had gone on an expedition, kayaking one of the most unknown rivers in the Congo. And he was with two American kayakers. Just out of nowhere, a massive croc came out of the water and took him under. And and his body wasn't found. And that was just a couple of weeks before we were supposed to meet up. So, I mean, the whole thing was just crushing. It was such a blow. I, I was devastated. I couldn't think of, of a way to go forward anymore. I couldn't imagine the world without him existing in it and life continuing on without him in it. And uh, and so I just got into a really dark place and psychologically and very depressed. And I, I mean, I had been through a lot of things in life and I had many blows, but I, this one I think hit me the hardest of all. And, I'm, and I usually find a way to bounce back, but this time I just couldn't find a way to bounce back again. And you know, it was just like it was the last straw. I think after everything else, <laughs> you know, everyone I had lost in life, and and so I decided that the only way to go about saving myself was to be proactive and take on a massive challenge. And why a bicycle? I can't properly tell you, but the idea kind of put was put in my head uh, when one of his friends at his funeral, or it wasn't really a funeral, it was a, a memorial in Africa. Was we were sitting around the table and talking about him and his life and she was saying you know I'm I'm now 30 and I think I want to settle down but I want to do something big before I settle down and I was thinking I wanted to ride a bike maybe across Canada and she's like do you want to come with me and I remember thinking oh I've already been across Canada not by bike but I had been across Canada I was like well I'd rather be somewhere I haven't been yet and if I was going to take on a bicycle journey where would I want to go so I started to do research and eventually came upon the men who had cycled around the world and I thought, well, now that would be an, <laughs> a massive adventure, the ultimate adventure. And and since I never wanted to do anything by halves, I thought, well, if I'm going to go ride a bike anywhere, why not make it around the world? And then doing the research, I found that there hadn't actually been a woman yet who had done a complete circumnavigation, and certainly not for any kind of a record. I thought, well, that's strange. Why not? So I said, well, if I'm going to go around the world, I might as well target a record and if I make it great if I don't that's okay too uh, it wasn't the end all point of the ride but it would, would it be nice plus and so with that idea in mind I started to train myself started pedaling a bike and uh, it was just a heavy road bike no it wasn't a road bike it was a kind of a hybrid almost like a city bike touring bike I'd say and and I just started riding it a little longer a little longer every day I was teaching English in a public school in Naples at the time. So I would ride early in the morning and then go teach in the afternoons. And yeah, and eventually uh, I met a trainer who gave me a program and said, look, you can need to build some muscle and some cardiovascular strength since I had no muscle. I was not done anything athletic for, you know, years and years. So I started to follow this program. And about six months after I met him, I set off around the world oh oh and then i decided i better go light so i had this big heavy bike uh, and i said well if i have to do 200 plus kilometers a day i should probably go as light as possible so i changed the whole plan last minute and got a road bike that was a carbon frame uh, and in hide and sight was possibly the worst bike i could have ever gotten for this journey because it just constantly broke down the whole way around but, you know, I did learn to fix a bike along the way, and I got really good at changing punctures, <laughs> changing the tube, patching tubes. And, yeah, so I set off really eight months after I'd first gotten on a bike and headed off towards, well, across Europe towards going which way I went, east to west. Most people won't go west to east because of the winds. But because I couldn't find a sponsor and I was delayed in my leaving, I ended up going the opposite direction to avoid hitting the Asian monsoon. So it was a choice between monsoon or headwinds most of the ride. So I chose headwinds. 
and they were pretty debilitating, I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, headwinds are the most demoralizing thing for a cyclist. Like, you know, take mountains, you can take rain, you can take whatever, but a headwind, it, it just, you, it, you lose the will to cycle. <laughs> Absolutely. Before we get into more of the detail around the, the world's, the world cycle that you did in 2012, I just almost wanted just to take you back a little mm-hmm. bit because you talked about having, you know, having to get over a lot of these tragedies that you that you suffered and being in very dark places and being depressed and yeah. and how you sort of bounce back. And I know that there'll be people listening who may not have been through similar things to you, but may be in dark places or, or may have suffered tragedies. And I was just wondering, what advice would you have f- for the listeners out there who who may be um, maybe in a similar place at the moment? Yeah, well, I would, I suppose it comes from learning it the hard way. Um, this, this guy that I, that died, he used to say that the strongest metals are forged through the hottest fires. Uh, and the only way to become strong is to go through those dark places. And unless you do, you actually, I mean, I know many people who have had very easy lives and the moment the smallest, the smallest thing hits them, they break, you know, they, they can't, fix themselves again and, and they're so fragile unfortunately the only way to get stronger is to <laughs> is to first be weak uh, and I've learned that so now every challenge every difficulty that hits me I know it's just a stepping stone and it's going to take me further as a, as a person or as an individual and knowing that and coming through the dark times and knowing that you do come out the other end eventually no matter how long it takes you you know you can pull yourself out of it the more you do that the more the less you are afraid of of those dark places and the the less dark they become and the more you you know, you know you it just becomes the next challenge in the game of life and so actually I, I start to wonder sometimes when things get too easy for me I start to wonder well, what's wrong something's about to happen because <laughs> I think that the more that you that you take the more you can take uh so yeah I would say you know when you're going through hell just keep going um and you do come out the other side but it helps to be proactive. So I've always tried to, to find a way to bounce back by cycling the world is a bit extreme, <laughs> but you give yourself a purpose in order to keep yourself going. Cause as humans, we need purpose. Um, and that's what we thrive on is, you know, we actually thrive when we're, when we're in a place where we're being challenged, um, whether that's physically or mentally. And that's often why people take on, you know, these kind of athletic endurance feats is because maybe they need a challenge. Uh, to give themselves a purpose. So, yeah, give yourself a purpose and a purpose to wake up every morning. Absolutely. And it can be the smallest thing. It can, it can be, it doesn't need to be a, a physical challenge. It can be anything, but just find that purpose for yourself. So you're on this world cycle, world cycle trip. It's insane distance. You've got to cover over 28,000 kilometers by, by bike. What goes through your head when yeah. you, when you're when you start a challenge like this and the and and how does it progress day to day? I think because I wasn't really in my right mind, I didn't really think through the logistics or what it would mean to cycle around the world. So I think I really took it on a day to day level. I didn't think about if I thought about the whole the whole picture, the big picture. I think I wouldn't have done it. it would have just been too overwhelming. So I took it in bits and pieces, and it was really let me get to the end of this country or to the end of this continent and then we'll see from there. I didn't actually believe at the beginning that I would. I hoped I would, but I didn't think I would make it all the way around. And I actually was hoping I would and I was kind of a bit on a suicide mission. Like it would be okay with me if I didn't make it back. So I think that I left feeling that either I would make it back having having found a way to move on and um having processed um this person's death or just not come back, you know. So it really was that mentality when I set off. But you know, by the time I reached the halfway point, I had changed so much in the way I saw things, and my desire had been reawakened to have new experiences, to keep going, to have new challenges, to, you know, my my will for life had had completely changed. And I think by that point, I was like, wow, I might actually make it. <laughs> so then it became well, all roads from here on lead to home. So. um let's get home. <laughs> and it was, it was difficult because I didn't have money and I ran out of money and I ended up almost having to come home. And then a lot of people were following me online 
um, wanted to see me continue. So they all started sending me little donations every month, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 50 pounds, and everything added up to keep me on the road. And so in the end, that's, I mean, that's how I got home. I just by, you know, hundreds of, you know, over a hundred people just sending me little bits and pieces along the way and people putting me up on the way, uh, feeding me. And it was incredible to me to, to experience the entire planet. That one thing it was, it was pretty much consistent throughout the entire ride across all these countries and cultures and continents was, was human kindness. And I found that, you know, it was everywhere and people were genuine, genuinely curious and good. And it was, I, yeah, it, it renewed my, my faith in humanity as well. And I know it's easy to feel, I mean, especially these days when I look at the news and it's constantly just you know, terror everywhere. People are at war and bombs and people shootings and stabbings. And, and I was actually reminded of this and I was just on a ride up from my home in Naples to the Dolomites. And I was like, you know, I can't, I don't want to look at the news. I don't want to see anything more because we're just a horrible race. The human beings are just terrible. And I had completely forgotten, you know, the kindness of strangers was, is everywhere. And this ride kind of renewed that, reminded me of that, of that, because it was a tough ride. I had breakdowns the whole way. I had bad weather and my bike was giving me troubles. And all along the way, people were desperately trying to help me. Like they were, I was confronted with people everywhere. I was trying to escape from them, but I was confronted by them. And, and no matter where I went, people wanted to help, wanted, you know, wanted to know what I was doing. Uh, wanted to give me food, help me fix my bike. And, and I was reminded that, you know, what we see on the news is not reality. It's a small part of it. But by and large, you know, the human race is genuinely good and human kindness is everywhere. Absolutely. And what was like one of the, the standout moments from your trip? So, you know, you, you talked about sort of whether it, the human kindness, whether it was meeting someone or was it crossing that halfway point or was it coming to a certain city or to the edge of a country or seeing the sea was there was there certain moments along the way which really stood out for you there were so many it's oh, it's hard to pin any one down <laughs> many of the most incredible moments i had were right off the back of a difficult moment so uh after a particularly brutal climb for example you know 100 kilometers up the hill up a, up a mountain and just in total pain and then summiting that and just getting this rush of, wow, I did that. And, you know, what else can I do? And then you know, you're just confronted by the incredible view and you just get this feeling of connectedness to everything and, and this rush of being alive. And, and so some of the best moments I had, yeah, were after the really, really tough days, passing through those tough days and coming out the other end and going, you know, I rock. <laughs> How cool am I? Like, I never would have imagined I could do that, but look what I just did. And then what else can I do? And so, yeah. Um, and those, and, and yes, many of the human encounters as well were some of my favorite highlights. It's like, uh, in New Zealand, for example, I ended up cycling desert road, which is almost 200 kilometers of nothing, no service station, nobody around. And the military actually use it for training it's up on this mountain plateau so i had been steadily climbing this plateau all day and i hadn't eaten i had no more water and i was feeling pretty desperate and then night set in and with night came these really strong winds um which were over 100 kilometers an hour and i couldn't ride anymore so the wind was lifting my bike up in the air i was walking along uh, trying to stay on my feet and I, and I started to get hypothermic but as long as I was pedaling, I could stay warm. But now I was like, I had this sweat from cycling all day. And then it was minus temperatures. And, and I started just shivering uncontrollably. And I had no idea where I was. My GPS was broken. My phone didn't work. And I didn't know where the nearest town was. And I was for one moment very in very real fear of, <laughs> of my, my safety. And then this camper van happened to be parked by the side of the road. And I saw this old woman inside washing dishes. And so I went up, banged on the windows, help me. And she came out. She said, what are you doing out here in this wind? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. And <laughs> just need some help. I think I'm, I think I'm getting hypothermia. So she and her husband had just pulled over to have a, a, a short dinner and they were on their way to the next town, which was 200 kilometers away. And they took me in. They fed me whiskey and tea and sausages and they got me all warmed up and then the question was where would I stay the night because I had I told them about my ride and the rules 
I couldn't go back on myself. So they said, look, we'll just park here for the night and let you sleep here. So that's what I did. And they, you know, I slept in their camper van. They got me up early morning, gave me breakfast and set me on my way. And, you know, it was really that those kind of people that made the ride incredible. Um, and, you know, we're still friends on Facebook. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, and they're a lovely couple. When you came back after your trip, you'd spent, you know, you'd, you'd cycled mm-hmm. 18,000 miles, 152 days on the road, crossing four continents, 19 countries. How yeah. did you, did you want to go back to being a teacher or, or did you decide that actually cycling was your next love, your next passion, and that's something that you wanted to continue? Yeah, I think it was very difficult after that kind of um, heightened experience, I guess, to go back to my teaching for me was never, it was a means to an end. It was never my goal to be a teacher. It was more of a way of being able to travel and see the world. And then when I got on a bike and saw the world on a bike, I thought, my God, that's what I want to do. And I realized that I, you know, I had a gift for cycling really long distances <laughs> and I was actually pretty good at it. And so I guess the first months coming back was just kind of a evaluation of what did I want to do in life. And I did try teaching a bit again and I just couldn't do it anymore. It just, you know, it wasn't what I wanted to do in life. And I thought, well, I better pursue what I do want to do. So then Mike Hall invited me. Mike Hall was the fastest man around the world at the time. And he was setting up this race, transcontinental race across Europe. And it is now one of the toughest unsupported endurance races out there really cool race so this was the inaugural one in 2013 and he said look you want to join the race because we need women and since you've already gone around the world you might as well go across europe again (laughs) so i think okay i'll try so i joined the race and that was my first experience of long distance ultra racing and i got really addicted to it so it was fun i came in ninth place i was the only woman in the race and didn't do bad at all and thought wow I, i was cycling much greater distances than I had been on the world cycle. I thought, well, how much further can I go than that? So then it became a question of continuing to push my own personal paradigms and what my, what I thought my limitations were and what my limitations actually were. And so I was curious to find that out. So I got into racing from that. And then the following year I entered the trans am bike race. And that was the inaugural race across America, crossing some of the most beautiful country out there, but also the toughest and took all the mountain climbs that exist, (laughs) all the mountain ranges uh, in America. It's a beautiful route and took that on. And that was really one of the toughest uh, long distance cycles I had ever done. And that was because from the get go, I had a really tough time. I fell and crashed on the second day and cracked my rib and bashed up my knee, ended up continuing the ride on a cracked rib, which was not fun. Then halfway through the ride, my seat post broke and couldn't get it fixed because nobody in the U.S. had that particular part, which was only made by this German bike manufacturer. So I ended up racing half the race on a broken seat post, which was all the way down. So I was riding like a little kid with my knees up high Mm -hmm. and my bum down low and was killing my knees the whole way because these climbs were steep. Some of them were, you know, 18, 20 percent gradients and on that kind of a in that kind of position, I was pretty much blowing up my knees. So I was on painkillers to keep the swelling down the whole way. And when I got to the end, yeah, I had to be wheelchaired onto the plane. But I did finish. I won the women's category and came in fourth place in total. And all things considered, a pretty good ride. <laughs> um, and that, that's when I kind of started to get into the whole concept of mind over body and mind over matter. And, and you know, when your body should quit, but your mind is not ready to, how much further can you go? And yeah, and that's taking me on the whole other direction of, of the mind-body connection and what that means in these kind of endurance sports, Not, but not just in endurance sports, in life too, on every level. How far does your mind rule what happens to you in everyday life? Yeah, that's been sort of my curiosity as of the last couple of years, that and pushing my personal limitations, not just in cycling, but in everything I do in life. Absolutely. I mean... God, I mean, just hearing the distances and the mountains and, you know, the cracked ribs and talking about that, that mind over matter and how you've applied it to life and it's, and it's given you that curiosity. What do you think you've learned yeah. most about that? Two things. So after that, I thought, well, now, you know, if my mind, if my body is the machine and my mind is the control panel, it's really about pushing that machine. But 
then I realized that you can't push the machine to breakdown point because the machine will break down at some point. So you've got to find that balance. So the next year, I went on the um, transcontinental again and cycled, I think it was a 1,000 kilometers in two days. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, my knees completely collapsed. As in, I, as in I couldn't hardly even walk on a much less pedal. And basically what happened was that I had destroyed the patella disc. I destroyed the cartilage during that, that Trans Am ride, completely ruined them and hadn't gotten them checked out and thought, you know, I've always just functioned on that whole concept of, you know, I can do anything. <laughs> so then I had to go through a whole process of rehabilitation, getting my knees sorted out and fixing it. And I thought, well, okay, so actually you've got to take good care of the machine if you want it to work to the maximum level that you want it that your mind could take it to work right so it's really it's really about exercising both and finding out what the balance is between them so you can't use you know you can't just go and use one without the other so you you can be physically fit but if your mind is not in it you're not going to go far either uh so it takes both working together in unison and i do many things to help to help strengthen my mind as much as my body so my body i'm I've changed a lot of my uh, workout regimen, the way I eat. I try and keep it clean. I try to use fat for fuel instead of carbohydrates. So I'm on a ketogenic diet, uh, which reduces inflammation, since I have a problem with inflammation in the knees. And then mentally, you know, I meditate. I, I try and keep my thoughts positive all the time and, you know, not accept any negativity in, in my life. And that includes in conversations and with the people I deal with. And, you know, if I find someone's being a negative influence in my life, I try and distance myself from them and from that influence. So it's it's just being consciously aware of, of every aspect of just, I think, learning to be present in everything, understanding your body and your mind in every moment, I think is an important, an important exercise. You're the first woman to cycle around the world. You were the only woman in the transcontinental race in 2013. You were, uh, yeah. you won the women's category in the Trans Am race in 2014 and came fourth overall. Mm -hmm. So you are out there and you are competing with the men in, in a very sort of yes. male, male dominated. Can you talk us mm -hmm. through that? I mean, how, how is that? Or how is, yeah, how, how is that? Do you know, um, I think in the last couple of years, we're starting to see more and more in the endurance sports world that women are just as capable, if not even more uh, advantaged towards endurance uh, over men. And, and now women are starting to win a lot of these races or come in the top three, the top five overall. So like the trans um, race this year was won by a woman in all categories. So it's becoming more and more, more and more women are getting out there for starters and trying these races. And it only takes a few startings for other women to see, oh, wow, that's cool. We can do that too. And so, you know, more women every year are starting to join, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and we're taking on the men. And so now there's not even any more a woman in men's field. It's just like we're all racers and we're all racing together because the women are just as adapted to it as the men. And I'm really excited seeing that, how that's coming about. And so far, just in the endurance world, but I'm sure in many other fields, it will start to become apparent as well. And I think maybe that's because now women, well, you know, there was a lot of the cultural background behind women not really participating as much in sport and not being sponsored in sport. And we have to raise the children. We have to stay home with the family and all of that. And, you know, women are now working jobs and raising the family and taking on sports. So we're pretty much super women. <laughs> we, can, like, we can do it all. And so, yeah, in the beginning, since I, since I was one of the first doing these kind of races, there was a bit of, I won't say sexism, but, uh, I think there's a lot of ego involved in the cycling world and always has been and I think always will be. Cyclists are a special breed, but particularly with the men, it's, it's really a testosterone thing. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of egos getting bruised. A woman, you know, you know, the whole phrase, like, you know, you, ah, oh, you run like a girl, you cycle like a girl, you hit like a girl, that kind of thing. Um, I've kind of taken that and been like, yeah, I ride like a girl, try and keep up. <laughs> so, so it's, um, when I was winning in the Trans Am race, uh, when I started to pass everyone and I started to go up into the front six, seven, all of a sudden there was this explosion online on Facebook of everyone watching the race going, oh, well, you know, Juliana's only cycled for two and a half years. It's impossible that she's beating the men who have cycled for 20 years. Therefore, she must be cheating. 
And so all kinds of cheating accusations went on online, like, oh, she's doping. Oh, she's got a camper van following her. Oh, she's drafting. Or it was everything. It was a, it was actually thinking back on it now, pretty funny. Like it was just random accusations, but people couldn't believe that a woman could cycle like the men were cycling. So there was all that. And I just, you know, I just confronted it straight on. Like when I heard about it, I got online and I wrote and I said, you know what? I'm here to have a really good ride, to ride hard and to have fun. And for the rest of it, I don't give a shit what any of you say. I'm just going to ride my bike. And that kind of shut everyone up. And, you know, then when I ended up coming in at fourth place, there was a kind of a silent applause even amongst the men that, yeah, you know, that was that was badass. And now now seeing that men's mentality in the whole in the whole endurance racing field has changed and they're all starting to say, well, yeah, actually, the women are riding just as well as us. So, you know, let's not even make categories anymore. Let's not even make the women's dots pink and the men's blue on the spot tracker. Let's just all be the same color. It's that kind of mentality now. So things have changed and they're changing, which is cool. Oh, absolutely. And um, what, what are your best tips and advice for women out there who are, who are competing with the men who may be dealing with accusations of cheating or, or just having to deal with the, the comments or whatever's being, being thrown at them? What advice would you have? Yeah. Oh, you know what? Just water off a duck's back. If you're doing it for you, it's, it's the only reason you should do anything. I mean, it's the only reason I do anything is for me. It's not for anyone else. It's not for anyone's approval or anyone else's opinion. And, uh, and I do it for my personal enjoyment and pushing my own limitations. And I'm not out there to bruise anyone's egos or, you know, to even win the men or win anyone. I'm winning over myself and that's what I do it for. And I think you have to be just keep in mind always why you're out there and why you're doing it. And if you're doing it for the right reasons, it doesn't matter what anyone say, because, you know, those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. So, you know, just do it for you and keep going. That's it. There's, there's no other reason to do anything in life. <laughs> and I think sometimes as well, I mean, especially when you look back what you've been through and what you've accomplished and, you know, how you've come out of this darkness, you're such a strong person that actually some people's opinions don't actually matter. And as long as, I think sometimes it's comes down, to, yeah, it comes down to almost like knowing yourself and knowing why you're doing it and why it's important. And actually, if you, yeah. if you've got that inner core of strength, then actually it doesn't really matter what, what other people think. But sometimes it can be difficult to get to that stage because, oh, you know, I think, women yeah. especially that you know I know I I have it you know I want to be liked I want people to like me but I think you need to get to that point where yeah. actually well who are the people that you're stressing about like do you even like them do you even respect them that do, does their opinion exactly even matter so let's, exactly. Talk, let's talk a little bit more about the race across America I mean mm-hmm. that's one of the longest running endurance sports events in the world it's traveling 3,000 miles yes. across 12 states and climbing over well, this is a crazy, like over 170,000 vertical feet. Now, can you, I mean, do you get invited into that race or do you need, how, how does that all sort of happen? Okay, so most people have to qualify to participate. And by qualifying, you have to do different sportives of, I believe it is 400, 600 and 1,000 kilometer qualifying races to get into the race across America. I signed up. They let me in instantly on account of my previous racing history. Uh, so I didn't need to qualify. And I think if you can prove that you're able to do great distances like that, then, you know, they, they'll take you in without having to do qualifying races. So I entered it really just to find out what all the fuss was about, I suppose. And, you know, it is slated as the toughest endurance race out there. But I have to say... Having done, you know, some of these unsupported races, the whole race across America to me is unjustifiable for the costs. Just the sheer cost alone is mandatory to have two follow vehicles, which means you need like a crew of eight people. They're following behind you the entire time. You go across all of these highways, these busy kind of motorways and highways in America, which makes no logical sense to me. So you're automatically putting the riders in danger uh, just on the route alone. It's full of rules. It's you, you're going to spend upwards of twenty to thirty thousand pounds just for one rider, and that's not for the ones who go by pairs or teams of four and eight. I can't even imagine logistically how they would do that. 
so this just came like it was an experience. I wanted to see well, what what would it be like to uh, to to write it, and why why is it such a big deal? And I had just done the Trans Am, which is which is about I would say two thousand kilometers longer than the Ram, and much more climbing, much greater altitudes than the Ram, and that is completely unsupported. So you're finding your own food and water. You have to navigate yourself. You you're sleeping on a, you know, on a little mat rolled out in the bushes every night. You're sleeping maybe two, three hours a night. The whole thing is much tougher to me, but so much more enjoyable because you're going through such beautiful terrain, beautiful roads, beautiful, quite quiet, you know, not in, in none of these busy, busy roads. And it just, the whole thing made more sense to me. So coming into the Ram, I think it was by the second day, I was already thinking, What's the point of, of this race? There was, it seemed to me there was no point apart from, yes, suffering, but there was no enjoyment or beauty to offset that suffering. And then to me that, then there's no point to do it, you know, cause you've got to have both. And to me, like just the suffering without the reward was a pointless endeavor. <laughs> it just, you know, and I totally admire people who go back year after year to do the, to do the ram and to do that same route over and over. I cannot imagine mentally how. They, they, they can do that because I don't mind to suffer physically and mentally, but I need to have, I need to be enjoying the ride. I need to be able to see beautiful sights. I need to be having fun as well as suffering. So, um, anyway, the, the round was for me a good experience because it, it brought me back to the fundamentals of why do I love to cycle? And it's not actually because I love to race or it's not only because I'm such a masochist. I'm enjoying this suffering because I can see my God, I'm so tough. It was no, I, I loved cycling because it brings me back to the fundamentals of existence when you do without all the things you need you think you need every day uh in everyday life and you know what are the basics of existence is just eat and sleep and ride that was it and you know you carry such a minimal amount of gear you have one set of clothes everything is just minimalized and simplified and so I love that. I love that feeling of being on the road and not knowing well, where I'll end up that night or when I'm going to eat next. That feeling of everything is possible. And that to me was the excitement of it. So I guess what Ram taught me, and although I didn't finish it, I, I went into it enough. I think I made it about 1,500 kilometers before I got pneumonia and had to be pulled from the race. But uh, what it did show me is what I want to do from here on out, which is continue these kind of endurance rides, but unsupported and the kind of riding that I love. And sometimes you need to have those experiences to actually know what it is that yeah. you, you love that you love to do. And you obviously, you've obviously found that. So what would be the next endurance yeah. ride, unsupported ride that you would love to do? What's on, what's on the bucket list? Well, the next one coming up that I'm really interested in participating in is the inaugural race across Australia. And that's going to be in March. So, yeah, I've started training again and really looking forward to hopefully entering in that race. God, that will be, that sounds amazing. Do you know what's, where, where is it to and from? It is from Perth to Sydney, going through the Nullarbor Desert following the coast. So it's called the Indian Pacific Wheel Race. And it's, yeah, it's the first unsupported Trans Australia nonstop race. Oh, that sounds exciting. And do you have one quickly? One of the things you mentioned mm. earlier, which I was really interested about, is you talked about you follow like keto or you do fat burning. And so you sort of like yes. reduce your carbs down. How have you found that in the endurance world? Have you found that benefit? Because when I, I, I mm. did a running race called the Marathon de Saabs, and I was very much into, mm -hmm. in, into the fat burning. So sort of trained, changed my diet a lot and, and found it incredibly beneficial. I'm just wondering, um, how, how you mm -hmm. found it. For me, it's been a night and day difference in that I never had carb crashes like I used to when, you know, cyclists especially or any, yeah, any kind of endurance event running would be the same, I imagine. But as you know, if you're on carbs, you've got to keep, you have to have a constant intake. And the moment that you, you know, your body runs out of that, that sugar, that you get that sugar crash and, uh, and you bonk. So being on a high fat, keto diet you never bonk which is incredibly useful in these long distances when you might go 200 kilometers without finding anything to eat and it's great because you don't get hungry as you must have experienced so you know you don't get those sharp hanger pains i used to become such an angry 
<laughs> I called myself the Incredible Hulk. You know, I would get like hunger after I and my energy stores were running low. I would just become into this, this horrible, angry person until I could eat again. Uh, so uh, I know, don't have those anymore, which is great. And lots of energy. It's given me a lot more energy. So it's just more efficient for burning. So your body just becomes... I think at its maximum efficiency and fuel consumption wise. And I compare it to, you know, running a car on a dirty oil versus clean fuel. Uh, and to me, yeah, it's, it's changed everything. So in a race like these kind of cross country, cross continent races, it just means you stop a lot less than the other riders. You don't need to eat as much as the other riders. And when you eat, it's always very efficient food uh, that keeps you going a long time. So even if I'm going to be hungry, I can still go on and on and on without my energy stores. I've got great reserves and my energy stores don't crash. So, yeah, it's really useful. This is a question um, that I'd just be really interested in, mainly because I get this, these sort of comments all the time, especially when I when I tell mm-hmm. people, you know, I'm off to do this challenge or I'm off to do this race and or I want to go backpacking around South America. And one of the, one of the comments that I sort of mm-hmm. get is, oh, you know, but you're a you're a solo female going off by yourself. Are you not scared? Of, you know, it's, yeah. it's so dangerous. And obviously you've gone off and done yeah. a lot of bike packing and a lot of so, solo travel adventures a, around the world. And I'd just be really interested in what are your yeah. advice or tips for women out there who want to do these challenges, but, but maybe are fearful or are scared? What advice would you have? I personally have found that being a woman traveling alone, you get cared for even more than like than the men. Like I will have ex- great experiences of people, you know, stopping anytime I need help. There'll, there'll be someone stopping to help me. People offering me food, come home for the night, and I'll have the guys who have been on the same route doing the same thing, going, "No one ever helped me." <laughs> it's like, Sometimes it's an advantage, actually, to be a woman traveling alone because everyone's like, oh, it's a woman alone. We better help her. <laughs> so, you get, so you get the opposite reaction. And I think also I just tend to be, you know, OK, on these races, I'm not exactly attractive anyway. I'm, I'm filthy and I stink and I haven't showered for days. And <laughs> so, you know, that's a great deterrent for any, you know, would be uh, attackers. Say that's not exactly an attractive woman. Um, and I do look capable of beating them up. So. <laughs> Uh, also, I think, you know, when, when I'm traveling alone, I try and dress androgynously. So I don't try and show off my assets if possible. So, you know, just be, be careful and be safe. But also, you know, stay within busier areas where there's always people around. You know, don't try not to go off into too, too much, too much isolation. When I'm traveling and doing these races, though, I always have a tracker on me. So I'm always being followed live over satellite. So that's also a great deterrent because if someone knows that you're being watched and your location is known exactly where you are, that's also a great deterrent. I always let anyone know if I'm feeling unsafe that yes, you know, I'm being tracked at the moment. <laughs> and that sets them, you know, sets them off as well. Or if you feel unsafe, there's many things you can do. Like you can always pretend that your, your travel companion is just up ahead of you. And I always have an invisible travel companion. So I'll be like, Oh, but you know, my boyfriend or my friend is just waiting up at the stop just along the way and that kind of thing. So. You travel smart. You don't put yourself in a potentially dangerous situation if you can help it. But I have to say that the world is a lot safer place than we imagine it to be. And I really never felt unsafe on any of my travels, I have to say, apart from maybe in a few experiences in India. That was about it. Uh, so, yeah, I think that it's more of it is more of that danger of a woman traveling alone is, is imagined than real. Now, you have actually written a book about your cycle around the world. Do you just want to share the title of your book? Yes, it's called This Road I Ride, and it was just released in May, I believe. So This Road I Ride, your incredible journey from novice to fastest woman to cycle the globe. There's also your first book you wrote, Not Without My Sisters, which is you know your story of, of growing up in, in the cult and getting out of there. Yes. Would you also like to just share your website details of where people can find more information about you and your racing challenges and your blog? Absolutely, yes. Um, my website is just my name, julianaburing.com. That's Buring spelled B-U-H-R-I-N-G. And the same name goes for my Facebook page, which is where I usually 
post all of my latest rides or updates or training or what's happening or, you know, updates on other women cyclists or other crazy events people are doing. And the same with Twitter. It's my Twitter handle is two wheels, double trouble. And that's two spelt by the number two. So it's number two wheels, double trouble. Please do drop me a line and let me know if you have any challenges out there that I haven't heard of yet, because I would love to take them on. <laughs> that sounds absolutely awesome. What I'll be doing is I'll be putting all of the links to Juliana's website and to her books, her Facebook page and her Twitter handle in the show notes, which you'll be able to find at toughgirlchallenges.com. Juliana, thank you so much for sharing so much of your story. It's been absolutely fascinating. There are so many different oh, avenues yeah. that I wanted to go down, but I was thinking the interview is going to last about like four or five hours um, at the end. But thank yeah. you so thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for your advice and tips and just the positivity that you that you shared and getting through those those really dark times absolute inspiration and i think a lot of women out there and men listening will be able to relate to your to your journey and what you've been through and how strong you are and what an incredible role model you are for for other women out there so thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast and for sharing your story thank you so much for inviting me it's been great chatting with you tribe i hope you are having a fantastic week i can't believe it's a, another tuesday i really hope you enjoyed that episode with juliana i mean what she has been through is absolutely inspirational so much top tips and so much top advice absolutely love that and what an incredible woman Talking of incredible women, don't forget about the Women in Adventure Expo, which is happening on the 8th of October. I'm going to be there. It's going to be a fantastic day. There's going to be some awesome speakers coming along. It's going to be held in Bristol in the UK. So make sure you get your ticket before the 30th of September. And what's quite exciting is actually the day after, on the 9th of October, the Tough Girl Tribe are going to be, a few members of the Tough Girl Tribe, are going to be doing the Commando Challenge. There's going to be about, I think it's about about four to six of us maybe, just sorting that out at the moment and we're going to be doing this commando challenge which will be amazing so i will be posting more details about that on the website so go and check it out if you're interested in getting involved um Yesterval Festival is happening and that's going to be from the 21st to the 23rd of October. So um, I'm going to be one of the speakers, which will be amazing. And I'm going to be talking about what I've learned from interviewing so many inspirational women over the past year. And it'll be good to meet more of you face to face. So please do come along to that. That's going to be absolutely fantastic. A couple of shout outs to the tribe. We've had loads of new members recently. So thank you so much for joining up. And if you're thinking, what is the tribe? Let me tell you. The tribe is a closed Facebook group. It is for the listeners of the podcast. It's for you. It's for you sat wherever you are sat or running or walking or wherever you're listening to the podcast. It's an opportunity for you to connect with other listeners of the podcast. It's a place for you to share your goals, your dreams, your ambitions, whatever they may be. It's a supportive group. It's an inclusive group. And it's just a way to really connect with like-minded individuals. I love the tribe. It's just absolutely amazing. So welcome to Sam Collins, Emma Burhouse, Linda Clark, Erin Bastain, Laura Zone, Meg Dios, Tiffany Morris, Samantha Rawson, Gemma Smith, Tegan Phillips. Absolutely fantastic to have you all here. There are so many um, more members, but I can't mention you all at the moment. Um, special shout out to a lady called Megan, whose nickname is also Tron. Now, talking of cyclists, Megan at the moment is currently cycling across Europe. And you can go and check out her blog at mega.bikes.wordpress.com. So Tron, you're doing absolutely fantastic and good luck. I know you'll be back in the UK in November, but have an absolutely fantastic cycle ride. A massive well done as well to Betty Mabry and her team of 10 runners who recently participated in the 175 kilometer race from Skagway in Alaska to Whitehorse in Yukon. Absolutely amazing. So keep it up, ladies. You are just inspiring women around the world. Absolutely awesome. Now, I also know that there are a couple of ladies out there who are injured at the moment. So Sophie Allen and Nikki Metcalf. I know it's really frustrating dealing with injury, but don't give up. Keep being inspired. Keep doing what you can do. But just remember to listen to your body. So 
massive thank you to everybody again for all of your amazing support. I cannot thank you enough. For everybody who does a retweet of an episode, who writes a review in iTunes or SoundCloud, who tells their friends about it. It honestly, it makes a huge, huge difference. So if you haven't subscribed to the Tough Girl podcast yet, hit that button and subscribe. It just helps to spread the message and helps to share all of these stories of these inspirational women. We've got some awesome women coming up from Emily Chapel, who is an incredible ultra endurance cyclist as well. We're going to be speaking to Kat Davis from Follow the Arrows, and she's done some wonderful uh, long distance hikes from the PCT to the 88 Temples, and she's also done Hadrian's Wall as well. Um, so lots and lots of great content coming up over the following weeks. So please do subscribe. And as always, if you want to get in contact with me, just send me an email, sarah at toughgirlchallenges.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at underscore tough underscore girl, all in capitals. Please do check out the website. As I say, tons of information on there about all of our previous guests who've been on the Tough Girl podcast. There's also a new page now for Tough Girl Extra. So these, these are the follow-up podcasts of women who I've interviewed before. These come out on an ad hoc basis on a Thursday. It'll still be 7am in the morning UK time. And it's just a very informal catch-up conversation. It's raw, it's unedited, and we're just finding out what previous tough tough girls have been up to. So we caught up with Emma Timmis um, a few weeks ago and Emma shared with us her adventure to the Dolmites, walking the Alpine, walking track over in Australia, as well as we also talk about our experience of running slash walking Hadrian's Wall. We're also speaking to Joe Bradford, who recently summited Everest a few months ago. Absolutely awesome. We're going to be speaking with Amy Hughes as well, who's the, now, the new world record holder for running 520 miles on a treadmill. Absolutely amazing I hope you followed her journey it was incredible anyway enough from me have a fantastic week and I will speak to you soon take care bye bye